appear to most of you as to what I am. I, I think I'm just now out, out eating the rainbow. And, and I work to try and be one. And I think I'm very successful. I, uh, <coughs> I, I have a pretty broad education. I, I graduated from the School of Hard Knocks, Magna Cum Laude. And I'm working now to extend that on my PhD in hard knocks. And I praise the Lord for every hard knock I ever had because uh, I feel like it just kept me humble and, and I'm a better person for it. So I, I'm going to give you just sort of a rambling story. Skip about some of us in chron chronological order and some of us not. <coughs> some, some things that I thought that Lord, I know every word that I tell you is the truth. It may sound kind of far-fetched, but nevertheless, uh, that's sort of what it's about. And if it gets to be too long, why, to be perfect, all right, say, hey, Roundhouse. I got this name Roundhouse when I worked in Chicky, went in the game the electrician up there. Because my name was House, he called me Roundhouse. And everywhere I've worked since then, and even around the people call they know me, call me Roundhouse. And I like that. Oh, I think he liked me. And uh, I, I made a few notes and kind of, kind of an outline. And when my daughter Betty Jo came in, I didn't know she was coming. <laughs> when Louie and I married, we were senior citizens. And so anyhow, we got two dogs, two lovely dogs. And at my age, I, I, I felt like it was more like grandchildren. And I treat them like this. And I spoil them, pick at them, they pick at me. And I want to tell you my first little story is about Betty Jo. She went to North, both of them went to North Georgia College and did very well. But Betty Jo went up there and she told all her friends that her father, that's me, that I was seriously mentally retarded. <laughs> and that I made my living standing down in front of the bank at Jefferson, seven pistols. <laughs> <laughs> now that might have made some of you mad, but that tickled me. <laughs> if I'd have thought about it, I'd have played it on her. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, Jack, while you're talking, tell them what she told her co-workers this morning when she left to come up here. Yeah, she, she told them she was going to the restroom. She, she got a plane hooky from work, and, and uh, she's good at stuff like that. And I didn't think she had heard a certain amount from me. Anyhow, that's great. And I think people love you whenever you're a good sport. And uh, th this is not in the order that I meant for it to be, but I want to tell you just a little bit about visiting the Ford Museum and the Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan. It's a long story about what you see there. But it's the most interesting place. If you ever decide to visit there, I think you need to allow at least two days. One day to visit the Greenfield Village and one for the Ford Museum. But I'm not going in detail about what all I saw because there's a million things up there. Very interesting. But one of the things that struck my attention that I thought it was one of the most comical things I believe I, every time I think about it, I just want to burst out laughing. While we were going through this museum, I came up on this one exhibit that had a great big sign that said, Thomas Edison's Last Break. And, they, and there's a, a glass test tube with a cork in it and everything. I, I just wondered about it. who was nutty enough. Did they sit by his bed while he was they thought he was dying and held this test tube and when they thought he was breathing like socket up to his nose or something like that. That was so funny that, that they would do this and then put it on exhibit and I thought I know they were serious about it, but that's something that I, struck me as being the funny, one of the funny things I've ever seen in my life. Then I want to say just a word about uh, uh, Stone Mountain. First time I ever went over there, we went in the caravan of, of Ken Bokes. Model T Ford. That was about 19 and 29 or 30. And we carried picnic lunches. And we drove up to where that old path is. It comes down to the end of the mountain there. 
I guess most of you have climbed that thing, and I've been up it a, a number of times myself. But anyway, we loved our lunch all the way up that long path up there, and, and, and ate or picked me lunch on top of Stone Mountain. I, I, that was one of the grandest times I ever spent in my life at that time, about eight years old. And going up that path, the number of times that I went, I see you see lots of places where somebody scratched their name, looked like it was a nail or something like that, and I guess whether sooner or later they took that most of them away. But there's one name that struck my attention, about a third of the way up the path. And it's carved in there just like a professional tombstone story was carved in there. It has the name Charlie Bradfield, Atlanta, Georgia. And I think that he had, it was dated, I believe, about 1926. But that struck my attention. I've always wondered who Charlie Bradfield was. They went to all the trouble carving his name. And, and like I said, not just scratch with a nail or something. It, it'll be there, I believe, 50 or 100 years from now. So that story about, oh yeah, one more thing about Stone Mountain. <coughs> Betty Joe used to take us on a variety of trips. <coughs> When we left out of Atlanta, I always tried to look for landmarks so I could recognize where I was and so forth and so on. And coming back in one time, I looked down, and there was this thing that looked like a huge sandy beach. And I finally realized we were straight up over Stone Mountain. So that was very interesting to me. Then I skip over to uh, Family History. Um, my mother graduated from J.S. Green College. That was a forerunner of Piedmont College. I think it was a two-year course. She taught about 40 years, and every summer she took extension courses in the University of Georgia or where, wherever it was convenient and everything. And then ever so often while they, they would change the curriculum and they decided that some of her uh, courses didn't count anymore, so she'd have to take some to replace it. But she kept struggling along until she finally, about 1935, she got her BA degree from Old Fort University. And they, they uh, had the graduating exercise at the Erlanger Erla Theater down there on Peachtree Street. And that was a thrill to her and for all of us. My father had about a fourth grade education. And about the time he married, he took his inheritance. And he bought a farm, built a dwelling house, planted a huge crop of cotton with the intention of in one year's time he intended to pay all this all off. That was the year the boat was struck. He didn't make enough cotton to pay for the seed and fertilizer and he lost everything he had. He made a vow. He made a vow. There was a farm again. And he never got rich. You can imagine somebody had a fourth grade education with a struggle. He always had a job, but he never did pay a lot. They had seven children. The oldest three died in some kind of left then. And then I'm going to skip this, and not exactly like I say in chrono chronological order. My oldest sister, about 19 and 30, she had a ruptured appendix. And she went to the hospital at Maine. Oh, it was cheaper over there. Doc Castle, if y'all remember, he ran a little, he ran a little hospital over there. So anyhow, they had to get her somewhere quick, so they carried her to Maple. And at that time, whenever they, you had a, uh, an appendix operation, they wouldn't give you a sip of water for three or four days. But Evelyn never did, she never did, uh, never did complain about suffering from water one bit. And about a year later. She confessed to us. Somebody brought her a 
tracks ran east and west on, on Broad Street, out, Broad and, and out East Road, so you know. Then uh, they ran up Green Street, and, and uh, South Main from the depot to the square, and then it made a little circle around the square. I think it uh, uh, probably only ran for something like from 1920 to 1926, somewhere along there, not many years. I remember riding that probably one time. We came in from Maple at the Southern Depot, and my mother put us on the trolley car, went up Main Street, and one circle around the square. I remember that just like it was yesterday. I couldn't have been more than two or three years old, but anyway. I remember riding it one time, and I thought that was the most wonderful thing. Now, these tracks stayed in place, even though they didn't have any uh, uh, streetcars on them anymore. But they played in, stayed in place till somewhere around the early part of World War II, and then they dug them up for scrap. And I guess tried to make bullets to shoot at the Japanese and Germans. So, so. Uh, I our family moved to South Carolina to a rural area around Sheldon, South Carolina, where my mother taught school. <clears throat> and our father rigged him up a homemade school bus and took passage. I was about three years old at this time. The first Christmas came. My father surprised me, I guess he thought it was Santa Claus, with a goat wagon, two billy goats. And a little harness for him. I mean, you know, school boat stuff. This was a unique wagon. It had springs, coil springs under each, all four corners and everything. It had a little state body sitting on top of the little body that was made like a coach wagon. And it had a little spring seat. The little seat was almost like one that would sit on a two horse wagon or something like that. It made them the same stop. It had harness on before, don't think. And I feel like my dad must have been sort of in touch with John Barleycorn because uh, otherwise he wouldn't have attempted to do what he did. <coughs> Anyhow, he hit the jokes up and got somebody to hold them to him. He could put me up in the seat of the wagon, put the lines in my lap, and he gave me about one minute instruction on how to drive the goat. He said, take the right line in your right hand, your left line in there. When you want to go, go just wrap them on the back with the, with the lines and everything. When you want them to stop, pull them back. If you want to go to the right, pull the right line. If you want to go to the left, pull the left line, and so forth, so on, you know. And I said, okay. And I gave him a little rap. Those things broke like they were shot out of the camera. <laughs> I mean, they went. And there's a fine thing right straight ahead. And it looked like they'd hit him for the biggest tree in the thing. <laughs> I decided it was just suicide. I threw them lines down and I tumbled out. I saw the stars, I heard bells ring and everything. And that wagon just butted up against the tree, and that harness was torn to smithereens. One goat went one way, one little goat went the other way. That was the first and only time little goats were ever hitched up. <laughs> anyway, uh, they just ran around the yard. I don't think we had any fences around or anything. They just hung around. Got into everything you could imagine. Don't do that if you've ever been around. <laughs> but Dad had an almost brand new Model T Ford sitting in the car. My older sisters and everything were, were playing paper doll or something out there in the old car. And one of them goats came up there one day and he got up on the running board. Went up on the front fender, went up on the hood of the car, and he made one of them jump up on top of the car, and them sharp feet cut through that top. <laughs> and they, you know, he, the goat's down in there. When my dad came home that night, he was so mad, boy, he didn't hesitate. He tied a rope around the, the goat's hind feet, threw it over a limb or something like that, you know, and the old goat was crying like a baby, and he sliced his throat. You know, us kids cried like one of the family members. <laughs> we cried. But when he barbecued that goat and we ate it, we didn't cry. <laughs> we didn't know what he But anyway, that was a, I thought it was a very comical story, but it's all true and everything. And then uh, we 
move back, we move back to Maysville, Georgia. We move back to Maysville, Georgia. And uh, we lived on Sim Street for at least part of the year. I don't know exactly how long, but anyhow, if y'all don't make it, you know where the street is, and over the street over there. And uh, I, I love living everywhere we ever lived. I know it just seems like there's just something, something interesting or funny or, or something that if I studied by, I remember something that I enjoyed about living everywhere we ever lived. Uh, then we moved to Gainesville, Georgia, after that, moved on Main Street, about halfway between where Slack Auto Parts and Main Street School used to be. And uh, my sister started the school there. She's a uh, not quite two years older than I am. And I thought I could do anything that she could do. Uh, uh, Mary Lou went to school and she was in the same class. And she made out pretty good. So I begged the next year, I begged to go to school. And I drew Miss Claude Law for my teacher. And I, I'll bet she was a wonderful teacher. I don't know. But anyway, she, she had a gruff voice. And I'd never been around anybody like that in my life. The first day, I guess I was just literally scared to death anyway, and uh, she came to me and said, what's your name? <laughs> and, and it shocked me so I wouldn't say anything. I didn't plan on that. That went on three or four times, and then she'd get me up to her desk and make me hold up my hand, take a little way and she was with me until I cried on my hands. I'd go back to my seat. That went on two or three times every morning. Then she'd send for my sister. My sister was she was her teacher when she went to the town. She'd hand her a note and hand me to her. And the note would say, put Jack to bed, he's a bad boy. <laughs> well, like I say, we're gonna live three hours down the street. And I'd fight with her all the way home because I knew there was something bad about that note. I couldn't get it away. And of course, my mother's trying to cooperate. She'd been an old school teacher herself, so she'd put me in the bed. That went on for about three weeks. Finally, Mama decided that I wasn't going to ever learn anything staying home in bed. And, and I just about assumed been dead because I was tired of staying in bed. <laughs> but anyway, that was the end of that. The next year I went to, to a school in Oakwood and I drew a young teacher and the first day she came around and put her arm around my neck, hooked my neck, and I never had any trouble with any teacher back <laughs> But it, it was just such a shock when that woman talked so gruff to me. But I'll bet you she was a good teacher. I'll bet she was a wonderful teacher. But I'll never know. So <laughs> uh, while we were living in this house down on Main Street, my dad drove a new grade truck for a while. And I thought that was a wonderful thing to have a dad driving a new grape truck. You could get you some of that little grape drink. You know, that was one of the sweetest little drinks you ever saw. It tasted good like real grape juice. And then uh, Price Charter started this Crescent Ice Cream Company up there, uh, uh, almost across from where Palmer Hardware was up there, where the Mountain Center is now. And it was a, a, a real high class ice cream. They didn't have a retail store, they sold to drugstores, hotels, stuff like that. And although we didn't have a refrigerator, I think we had no ice box at home, but anyhow, he bring that ice cream home, you know, this real fancy stuff. It was in a brick form, and it had, some of it had lady fingers in it, it was a little piece of cake all the way through, so when you sliced it off, you had a little piece of uh, plain cake all the way through the ice cream. And we had that, and I thought that was the most wonderful privilege to have a daddy that brought ice cream home. And, uh, one day, where the city ice plant is now, there was a vacant lot there. The old wagon factory was there, but it was back off the street a little bit. And a circus came to town. It was, it was named Jack King Circus. And they came, and a little circus set up over there across the street from us. And I guess Jack King, King and his wife had a little girl about the same age as me here and my sister was. And she saw us over there play 
laid in the yard, so her family dressed her up in new clothes and shoes and everything, sent her over there to play. Well, when she came over, my sister, I guess they just jealousy on my part because they wouldn't have anything to do with me. So it's getting time of year to go back with them. So they took their shoes off and set them on the edge of the porch. And I was trying to figure out some way to get my revenge. And I saw that little girl shoes with pink socks and brand new. I thought, oh yeah, okay, I, I, I'll get my revenge. And I got those little pink socks and I muddied those things up and dirtied them and everything I could do to them. And that was a terracotta pipe there where, where you stick the tube down to cut the water off when it was coming from the meat or that thing. And I crammed them down in there. Well, that's why it comes time for the little girl to go home. No socks couldn't be found. First thing my mother done, she asked me, she said, Jack, did you know where the socks are? No ma'am. I pretended to have hunt or anything. And finally, I think my mom was smart enough to almost read my mind. She looked me in the eye. She said, are you sure you don't know where those socks are? I couldn't never, I, I never have told many lies in my life, but I never could lie and look anybody in the eye. So I confess that she was embarrassed, but she had to wash the little girl's socks and send, send her home with a wet. But now you talk about getting crazy. I, I got, I got my, what I deserve too. But nevertheless, it didn't break me out of me. I believe the old devil just had me, had me in, in a, I'm glad that I got over stuff like that. Also, while we were living there in that same house, the dad went fox hunting one night with somebody. When he came home, he had a, a, a grown fox and, and a one that was about half grown. This old house had, had, it didn't have a pavement in it, but it was high enough to where you could drive a car up under it and everything, and there was no chicken cook up under there. He put those possums in that cave. Carried me down and showed them. And he showed me how that old possum's tail was sticking up. You could just stick your finger up to it. And it'd curl that tail up around your finger. you pick him up. So, next morning, when he started going to work, he woke me up. He said, son, when you get up and get dressed, he said, bring that little possum up there where I work in the high school place up there. You blocked up. So I, I guess he's just kidding, but anyhow, I took him seriously. <laughs> I went down and I scared the old possum, old possum, you grin and show them teeth, it scared, scared the kids to death anyway, but anyhow. But when I raised that lid, that little possum tail was sticking up there and I stuck my finger up and he left that tail and I came out with it and everything. And I walked up Main Street, carrying that little possum all the way up to the ice cream store. I saw men in that lane that just died like <laughs> if a kid stoked a possum on his finger. <laughs> my dad liked to paint it. He didn't ever paint it out when I was five years old. But anyhow, I got through with that. Then in that same place, my oldest sister, she was probably about 15 years old. Mama went somewhere and she told my oldest sister, she said, you look after Jack. Give him a bath and one thing and another said, I'll be back after a while. Well, year before, Mama had always, uh, sometimes she'd give me the rag, but she would she used to stand you with that soap. I guess she knew what would happen. But anyway, my older sister, she put, she caught the water, put me in the tub, and gave me the rag and the soap. And that just takes a week of death, because I've been wanting to get a hold of that soap and just see how much soap suds I can make with it. So I kept on, kept on, until I just had my my head just like it's full of shampoo or something. And that was all fun and games, till it started running down in my eyes. <laughs> Boy, you talk about screaming and telling the world. I mean, I, you know, I never had had soap in my eyes like that before. And boy, I was hurt. My older sister came in there with a girlfriend that was come to visit. She said, I oh, mm, said, you have played with it? I said, what can I do? She said, I don't know. I said, I don't think there's any way to get it out. I said, you just have to let it dry. 
and said, when it dries, then your hair will be just as stiff as a boot. And said, when you get a haircut, you'll let, Daddy will have to take you to the chop block and, and cut your hair with the axe. Well, I took her seriously. I can imagine him left-handed. And the other lady doesn't look like a small holding my feet with one hand and cutting my hair with that axe. That scared me out of my wits. So I kept begging and begging. She said, well, it may be possible that kerosene would take care of that. <laughs> so anyhow, she went on. They just let me cry in one day or another. We had an old kerosene stove, so there was a five-gallon can of kerosene on the back, back porch. The only thing I could think of right quick was a shoebox. I found that shoebox and went up on the back porch there, and I filled it full of kerosene. <laughs> when Mama walked in, I had my head down in the shoebox. <laughs> <laughs> Mama saw that so out of my head, but boy, she gave my sister a fright. Yeah. That's the end of the story, I guess, of living that. Then we moved over to West Washington Street. It's about a third of the way down the hill, and I still had that old bit of wagon and everything. I guess the, the false body and the seat and everything was gone. But anyway, that, that wagon had roller bearings on it. It wasn't ball bearings, but it was, it was, it was fly if you put a little lard on them roller bearings and everything. I used to take that wagon Pull it up the hill to the corner of the square up there, between Preston Hotel and the McLeod Tennessee store. Boy, you couldn't do it today. If you pull it out in the street, they'd be suicide. But I'd, I'd pull it up right to the corner of the square, put one knee down in the, in the wagon, kick off with the other foot, and put both feet up in the wagon, and down the hill I'd go. And I don't know how fast I went. I bet I was going at least 15 miles an hour. And the end of the pavement was where West Avenue came into to the Washington Street. That was the end of the pavement, and there was a sandy place there. Every time that wagon hit that sandy place, it stopped. And I turned flips, <laughs> one right after another. And then maybe the next day, whenever I, whenever I saw it, got, got over getting hurt from deer bells and stars and so forth, I might try it again. But, you know, it's strange that even though there wasn't many cars, I don't remember ever meeting a single car going down that hill. That's where they used to have the soap operation in Yankee, you know, way back there. So anyway, I, I thought that was an interesting story. Then we moved over to the old Sheffield house at the end of West Broad Street. It was a huge old house with white columns on the front. <coughs> I, I read a story in the paper one time that that old house, it was a big old house, about three stories high. A big high porch and everything like that. It seemed like it was a mile from the, from the floor up to the ceiling up there where the swing chains were. But anyway, I, I had a wonderful time living there. And while we were living there, Preacher Sheffield had owned the house that his, uh, his daughter and uh, Ike Lay had moved in the house next door. And they had a son named Doug Guy Glade. And I believe Doug Guy Glade was the toughest kid I was ever around in my life. I learned all the good cussing that I learned, I learned it from him. He, he, I, I never was tough, but he learned, he taught me how to act tough. And he called me and him the Broad Street Duck Shooters. It wasn't the two of us. Now, y'all may not know what a duck shooter is, but back then they didn't call it a cigarette. The end of it, they didn't call it a butt, they called it a duck, a cigarette duck. And we patrolled that end of Broad Street up there by the cemetery, you know, maybe a little place where the car dropped off like that. And that's where them guys flipped them cigarette ducks out the window and everything like that. W.I. and I would get those things and smoke them. It didn't matter if the people that would smoke would throw them out and had AIDS or TV or whatever. <laughs> But I, 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 I have survived until I'm 75 years old, so I reckon it didn't hurt me too much. <coughs> but that's the I did, and I'm the only surviving duck, Broad Street duck shooter that is left, you know. That's all the story on that. Now, I may have done, gone too long already, but anyhow, a little bit more. In 1940, I went to work at Chickpea. This little lady right here, 
she is a pioneer of Chicopee because her family one of the one of the first families that moved into the village when they completed it in 1926 or 27, somewhere along there. But that was a wonderful experience working at Chicopee. And I met so many wonderful people and everything, and heard so many stories about them and their families and so forth and so on. But I finally worked my way into the machine shop up there. And do, doing uh, machine shop work, part of it was digging dishes, part of it was punching out sewer lines. We were the fire department, whatever. And we also had the, ch the charge of running the filter, the water filter plant. Way down at the foot of the hill down there and blow the water tank. Uh, they had the filter plant and they had the reservoir where they caught the water and ran it into the filter plant. And that was the most interesting thing about working at the filter plant. And the way he operated this thing, I had it on my ship. I would look at the water tank over there on the hill. <coughs> and that tank had a float on the inside, a chain that went over a little whirl up here at the top. And a flag that came down. <coughs> the water went up, the flag chain came down, and vice versa, and so forth. So on. That's where you could tell when it was time, if you had the pump running, it was time to shut the plant down and go start it up again. You could stand in the window of the machine shop and see this. Well, the old chain got rusty and it broke in two. The only way you could tell when the tank was full of end was just let it run until the water spilled out the top of it. So I kept wondering what they were going to do about it. One day I looked out the window over there and there was a bunch of them on, on the water tank walking around that little catwalk around the base of the tank. And it wasn't very long till the vehicle that they went over there in came back over to the machine shop. And I believe it was Arthur Edwards, he came in the machine shop and he said, Jack, the boss wants you to come over to the water tank. I crawled in with him. I always done what they, want, what they asked me to. <coughs> there never had been a soul in this world that was as scared of heights as I was. And then all of a sudden, just a little ways, I got to wondering what in the world they wanted me over there for. I never had been five feet off the floor, off the ground in my life. I said, Arthur, what does he want with me? He said, well, Mary Boyd is going up there and, and going down in that tank and there's an old rusty iron ladder on the inside and they're afraid that thing will break. They want you to go up there and tie a rope on him and stand and hold on the rope and everything in case the ladder breaks and everything you can catch it. Cold sweat popped out on my head, you wouldn't believe it. I said, oh, I can't do it. He said, why not? I said, I'm afraid to. He said, well, let me tell you this. He said, the boss said go over to the Shop and get Jack out. Said he's not afraid to go anywhere. Said now, if you want to go there and tell him, he said, I'm not going to tell him. Said you tell him that you're afraid if you want to. Well, I thought about that. Hey, I'm 10 feet tall. <laughs> I know now that Arthur economy. me. I know that boss did. <laughs> I know he did. But anyhow, I, I swallowed it. Who's lying to say? I went over there, and the ladder going up to that night, you know, they slanted up one of those legs, and I went, my heart beat like a bass drum. You'll never know what conquering fear is. But I, it beat if I had a weak heart, I would have died, I guarantee you. But I went, and when you got there to the little catwalk up there, it turned out from the leg of the tank, and it went the wrong way and everything like that. Your feet wouldn't sort of swing out in space ever since. But I went, and then I climbed on up the tank to the very tip top up there where Mary was going down inside. Wind was blowing, I believe, 20 miles an hour. I know what it scared in my life, but I went. I went, and I let, let them con me into doing it. But that was one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. I, I still can't walk a tight road as far as just going up a little ordinary heights and everything like that. I never did fear it anymore. And about, about a week, I think it was, I was going by to go down to the building plant. And I thought to myself, I, I, I didn't do that. I, I dreamed that. So 
I stopped the vehicle I was going in, and I climbed up there again just to, to convince myself that I really went the first time. <laughs> I did. But anyway, uh, uh, another another story about the water tank. They decided to paint that old tank. The painter did the old tank. And they had this guy named Ernie Puckett. I think me and Zeke there, we talked about Ernie Puckett. I think his mama was one of these boys that just his grand people were in. He was a good painter, but he was a big man. And they decided this was his size that he wouldn't do too good paint hanging on the scaffold around the side of the thing. So they decided this this pipe that went from the tank down to the ground and everything would be just about right, put him a little short seat with a block and tackle and everything, and give him his equipment, so forth and so on, brush and scrape and come down the tank. 